based on uh, a couple of papers. Especially in collaboration with the lives of Nico Perrito from UTH and the College of the Process. And I should also acknowledge uh, the contributions of my PhD student, Pai Saj, who is now uh, a faculty member in the University of Shogunia, and my current student, John Koshka, in the context of the Google Pipe series. But most of this, again, you find the So many of you know that according to the quantum theory of cancer evolution, from the emergence of the first uh, cancer cell DNA tissue to the time of diagnosis, tumor cells acquire mutations. And uh, some of them provide uh, proliferative advantage. Uh, this continues over time, they accumulate more mutations, and at the time of clinical diagnosis, tumors are usually highly heterogeneous. Uh, they have multiple cellular uh, populations, distinct cellular populations, harboring distinct sets of mutations. Uh, and they have, uh, still not working today. Um, so, why do we care about this? First, out of intellectual curiosity, we'd like to better understand how tumors evolve, they emerge and evolve. And most importantly, uh, treatment failures are mostly attributed to this intratumor heterogeneity. And there's obviously heterogeneity across samples, but within a sample, there are distinct cell populations, and they have distinct characteristics. Um, typically, with a drug, you may try to uh, target the dominant clone, kill it, but over time, uh, uh, seemingly insignificant subclones uh, emerge and they dominate the tumor uh, uh, tissue. So now that we have a lot of sequencing data, mostly bulk, but single cell uh, techniques are emerging, we can answer several important questions about tumor evolution. Uh, for example, how many distinct cell populations are there? Number one, for this particular case, maybe three. The next question is, for each population, uh, what kind of mutations they harbor? Third, um, what is the uh, fraction of each cell population in the tumor? There's obviously normal contamin contamination too. And finally, how exactly did, did these cell populations evolve? So we'll try to address these questions simultaneously. Here's a cartoon picture of tumor evolution uh, from the emergence of the first mutation uh, cancer cells acquire these mutations, uh, which are assumed to be inherited by all daughter cells. Um, typically, those who are in this business will make the uh, following assumption, infinite size assumption, that typically a mutation occurs once and only once in the evolution of the tumor and it's never lost. Um, it's obviously not always correct. We are working on uh, tools to address this. Uh, but for this talk, we are going to stick to infinite sites. And we are trying to uh, build perfect phylogenies as will become clear. Um, so as daughter cells inherit uh, all these mutations, they may acquire new mutations. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, we'll be able to infer how these uh, events occur in time. Uh, in the form of an evolutionary tree. So the evolutionary tree that corresponds to uh, this cartoon picture is as follows. We'd like to uh, identify distinct cell populations called clones. Each color, each node uh, refers to a particular clone. And we'll uh, assign a mutation to exactly one of these nodes. That's the first time that mutation occurs and all the daughter cells inherit that, right? It means that, for example, this red mutation is in fact present in all the uh, descendant cells, but we are going to place it at the blue uh, node. Then we'll have to figure out eventually, in the mixture that we have, what is the uh, fractional uh, contribution of each one of these cellular populations. Um, so as we said, bulk sequencing is the first thing that we uh, are doing these days, at least in uh, my medical school, I'm in the Department of Computer Science, but every time I go to a, a tumor board, uh, 
And we, we discuss uh, the results of bulk sequencing on the uh, metastatic tumor samples. Um, we, may, we may talk about actionable uh, uh, driver mutations and so on, but we never ask the question, what is the intratumor heterogeneity? What kind of cell populations there are? For various reasons, right? Um, particularly, computationally, this is a challenging problem, and also it's difficult to interpret the results. So far, at least uh, the uh, tumor boards that I'm familiar with do not ask this question. But we will uh, ask here, uh, we will try to infer the tree, uh, which is a non-trivial part uh, of analysis. So, how do we do that? For each mutation call, from a reasonably uh, uh, indexed uh, sequence tumor data, uh, uh, tumor sample, uh, we'll, we'll look at the mutations in comparison to the germline, of course, uh, that are distinct to the tumor. Uh, we are going to count the number of reads that include that mutation in comparison to those that do not, and the number of reads that do not include the mutation, uh, when combined with the ones that do include the mutation, would give us the uh, variant allele frequency, right? If we had a homozygous mutation and we didn't have any heterogeneity, every single cell in our mixture is a tumor cell, the variant allele frequency will be 100%. Uh, if it's heterozygous, again, uh, no heterogeneity, it's half, uh, 50%, and you can do the uh, calculation yourself. So suppose that uh, the uh, variant uh, uh, including reads and uh, the reference reads are provided there for each mutation. So provided that we also know the copy number of the region, Let's, for the sake of uh, simplicity, assume that we'll only focus on copy number neutral regions of the genome. When the copy numbers change, it depends on when the mutation came in. Was it before the uh, amplification or before? Uh, so we are not going to complicate our analysis by uh, asking these questions. We are going to assume that the number of copies of each region that we are interested in is two. So that, that will make life uh, much, much simpler. Uh, and we'll assume that genome is structurally unaltered, mapping is easy, uh, everything is uh, like the cartoon picture. Um, so given this very simple case, especially the top mutation, M1, uh, there are uh, tools, some of them developed by us, that infer some of the likely uh, phylogenetic trees that uh, uh, are feasible through this data set. So, um, if you have a single sample, obviously there are many, many feasible uh, phylogenetic trees that would that will explain the variant allele frequencies. Notice that we are talking about Illumina reads here. We are assuming that the uh, SMEs, we will focus on SMEs, we don't have to focus on just SMEs, we can talk about structural variants, small indels, and so on. But life will be uh, a little non-trivial with structural variation. So when I talk about the mutation, think of a point mutation. Um, if we are given just the variant allele frequencies of these mutations and no phasing information, we do not know whether two mutations occur in the same cell or they always are in distinct cells. Um, how, how can we infer a phylogenetic tree? Obviously, we cannot do it well. So the uh, short answer is there are many, many answers to this question, um, although we are not totally clueless. So is there anything that we can infer? The answer turns out to be yes. And uh, one of the tools that we developed for this purpose, uh, called Sit Up Single by Nidgun Gomez, makes the following uh, observation. So it will, it will assume that, let, let me ask the following question. If we knew, that two mutations occur, uh, occur simultaneously during the evolution of the tumor in the same uh, cellular population, in the same cell, then all the daughter cells will acquire both mutations. That's our assumption. So their variant allele frequencies are likely to be pretty much the same. If you were measuring them exactly, you'll get the exact same result. 
So uh, just clustering the mutations based on variant allele frequencies will give us a lower bound on the number of distinct clones. So that's, that's one very trivial observation, right? And this is what we'll try to do. Suppose that we have a bunch of mutations, like hundreds of mutations, and uh, if we knew the exact variant allele frequencies, if they came from three distinct clones, you would obtain, not this picture, but three uh, lines. So in this picture, we denote on the... Um, uh, x-axis, the frequency of a particular mutation. On the y-axis, it's the variant allele frequency. Right? But since uh, these variant allele frequencies form a distribution, uh, three distinct subclones will give three distributions. You'll get a mixture of these three distributions, and you'll have to tell how many distributions there are if you didn't have the colors. right? So that, that is our problem, uh, which will just provide you an up, uh, lower bound on the number of distinct clones. And this is, this is uh, uh, solvable as uh, demonstrated. This is not the main problem that I'm going to uh, focus on. It's relatively a, a simple problem. Um, unfortunately, the mutations that are clustered together do not necessarily belong to the same clone, as in the uh, uh, true tree uh, uh, depicted on the left, you may have the green and blue mutations with the same variant allele frequency, but they are from distinct uh, cell populations. Um, there's no way you can uh, put them apart, and the inferred solution uh, will be like the one on the right. In fact, there will be many, many uh, equally good trees to explain, for example, a data set uh, like that at the top, uh, even if we do not have um, mutations with undistinguishable variant allele frequencies. So for, for any data set, I can always sort the mutations out with respect to the variant allele uh, frequencies to form a linear topology. Right? It's one feasible solution for the input, or the others are equally good. So how can I tell the uh, difference? <clears throat> so... If I had two or more samples from the same tumor, then I can have uh, some additional cues, right? Because I had to come up with solutions to two uh, independent samples with potentially two distinct sets of variant allele frequencies. And the solution uh, for the overall tumor has to be at the intersection of the uh, sets of trees, evolutionary trees, uh, that are feasible for each data set. So all I have to do is figure out the uh, uh, distinct solutions, take the intersection, I'm done. And you don't have to do that. There's a nice uh, quadratic integer program that uh, uh, we came up with. Um, basically, the idea is, especially thinking that we are not going to get the WAFs exactly, um, we are going to place the mutations on the tree. Um, say a particular mutation is placed here. Um, now, then we have to estimate the uh, fraction of uh, uh, distinct cells. For example, this forms a distinct cell. Uh, we'll estimate the distinct cell population. They need to add up to one. And by clade, we mean the entire subtree under a particular node. We can add up the uh, 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 proportionalities of uh, each one of these nodes and compare against the variant allele frequency. The di difference is the error that uh, the infer tree makes. Uh, so with a quadratic error term, we have to, uh, uh, th that, that are added up through all mutations. Uh, we can try to minimize that uh, overall error term to uh, infer, given a particular topology, uh, what kind of an error we make. So we, we go through every single potential topology that is a feasible solution to each one of these uh, uh, tumor samples. They are from the same tumor, and whichever minimizes the error can be our solution. In reality, of course, it's very rare that we have multiple samples from the same tumor. Um, in clinical settings, it's almost impossible to have it. 
However, uh, we are not totally at a loss. Uh, liquid biopsies come in aid. For those of you who are following, uh, there are uh, advances in uh, liquid biopsying uh, that, that enable us to identify how uh, uh, the contribution of distinct subclones to the overall uh, tumor uh, change over time. We have uh, time series data. In fact, we, we uh, developed a tool called Synvict to see um, exactly what are the uh, uh, mutational uh, uh, composition of a particular tumor uh, that, that is identifiable from uh, the bloodstream. We look for uh, cell-free tumor DNA that we can hunt, and then we roughly estimate, again, the variant allele frequencies of each of the uh, mutations through uh, the blood samples. So, um, I'd like to show one particular example out of uh, 12 patients that we looked at in that study, uh, these are prostate cancer patients uh, treated uh, uh, uniformly. Um, and these are mutational loci on the uh, androgen uh, receptor, which is a crucial gene for uh, prostate cancer. And uh, the colors uh, uh, identify distinct time points. So, the uh, red uh, bars show the uh, variant allele frequency of a particular mutation before treatment. Uh, I think the uh, greens uh, designate uh, 12 weeks into treatment, and uh, blues indicate relapse. As you can see, with treatment progression, the co mutational composition uh, of the same tumor changes considerably. Um, the dominant clone that is identified with all these green bars totally disappears. Some, it may, it may look out of the blue, but if you do the analysis right, you'll see that uh, the uh, uh, green uh, uh, mutations did exist before the treatment. Uh, they they uh, uh, take over during treatment, and finally, during relapse, you have a completely different uh, set of mutations in a completely different set of subclones. So, unfortunately, liquid biopsies are not always available, and they do not give a very good idea about the variant allele frequencies uh, for, for many technological reasons. We can have a rough idea about their relative ordering, but not, not more than that. So, uh, the only way to really address uh, the uh, intratumor heterogeneity modeling is potentially through single cell sequencing. Right? You have a sample that you'd like to analyze, and in principle, if you can investigate each one of these cells independently and get their mutational composition, you can easily come up with a phylogenetic tree. So, in principle, this is great. Uh, and there are lots of uh, new tools uh, uh, emerging that aim to analyze single cell data. Uh, unfortunately, single cell data doesn't come uh, free. First of all, it's quite expensive, as you can imagine. And more importantly, uh, there are several problems with single cell data. Number one, some of you may have heard, doublets that are pairs of cells that are told to be single cells and sequenced and uh, interpreted that way uh, provide a major challenge. And, uh, doublets, doublet rate seems to uh, be uh, uh, going, uh, uh, seem to be going low these days, but still uh, they are, they are uh, quite problematic. Then um, there will be some subclones with zero sampled uh, cells, right? You'll miss some subclones, even though Say you, you got uh, a handful of uh, uh, cells from this mixture. You can see a doublet indicated here. You, you treated it as a single cell. Uh, these are normal. You'll notice that uh, from the blue sub, uh, subclone, there are no representatives that will make the uh, analysis more complex. And also, the uh, sampling will be non-uniform. 
you won't be able to get the true variant allele frequencies. You won't be able to easily uh, figure out the order of these mutations. But these are not the main problems. The main problems come from amplification errors. So first, uh, some alleles will be completely missed. They will result in false negatives with respect to a mutation in a cell. Or there could be insufficient coverage, which may uh, lead to low confidence uh, mutation calls. Those are the main uh, challenges. So uh, it's estimated that, and this is, this is the latest figures, due to allele dropout, the uh, uh, mutations that we miss consists roughly of 30% uh, of all mutations per cell. So that, that complicates everything quite a bit. Finally, obviously, the any sequencing errors, like bulk sequencing data, will add to uh, false positives. And uh, overall, these are the ranges of uh, uh, errors. For false positives, we are talking about less than 10 to the power of minus 5. Uh, false negatives, up to 30%. Missing entries, it could be up to 50%. Uh, it's not as bad as uh, false negatives, but it's still a problem. And uh, doublets, it can be again up to 30%, although it's diminishing. So that, that is the data that we are dealing with. Obviously, with such high error rates, we have to be pretty careful in our analysis. So, in a single cell uh, setting, the data will be presented as a matrix. You'll be getting a bunch of mutations, a few hundred rows, with hopefully uh, a few tens of cells. Um, and it's a binary matrix with some missing entries, right? Uh, one indicates that the mutation does uh, exist in that cell and zero. Uh, indicates that it doesn't. Um, obviously, you can uh, make a. Uh, uh, I mean, you can you can check out whether it's homozygous or heterozygous. You can have a, a two as well, but that's a minor issue. So from this, you'd like to come up with the mutational or uh, clonal tree. So um, suppose that we have a method to fix the false positives and false negatives. We identify the reds, we correct them. Uh, then coming up with a, uh, a phylogenetic tree that explains this data is pretty easy. So that's the perfect phylogeny problem. All you have to do is uh, come up with a root that would have mutations that are observed in every single cell, right? It's the, uh, it's the common product. And you can build from there. Um, so how can we figure out where are the false positives and uh, false negatives? Right, so that, that is the main uh, problem. And uh, for establishing a perfect phylogeny, it's sufficient to have uh, the following constructs uh, eliminated from a matrix like that. So I'll give you an example. Suppose that you have a bunch of mutations, in particular um, uh, three cells and two mutations with uh, the, fo the following uh, situation. Suppose that I'm dealing with C7, C8, and C9, and I have mutations N1 and N2. So can I fit these in um, to a to a phylogenetic tree? The answer is, um, if, if you look at it, no, under the infinite sites assumption. So in the uh, root, I should have none of these mutations. These are non-germline mutations, right? So in, uh, the, the absolute root is 0, 0. Um, mutation 1, 0. Mutation 2, 0. Then suppose that C9 comes next. C8 has to be a sister cell. It cannot be a descendant cell of C9 or an ancestor cell of C9. So you have the branching. Then we don't know where C7 belongs to. Yeah. So we have to avoid a situation like 
one, one, zero, one, and one, zero. As long as in no uh, box like that, we have the situation, we can always build a perfect phylogeny. So that's a pretty simple uh, test. And that also gives you an answer, a, a clue to uh, uh, solve this mystery. We may want to, say, minimize the number of corrections, bit flips, so that such boxes do not exist anymore. So I can easily come up with a combinatorial optimization problem that uh, makes it possible to establish a perfect phylogeny out of this matrix. I can uh, play with it, weigh the uh, 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 penalties so that they reflect false positive and false negative rates and so on. Uh, but this is the general uh, uh, direction of the problem. So, um, that's one way to go when we're dealing with single cells. But uh, it's an awful uh, lot of assumptions that you're making, especially when we're dealing with a false negative rate of uh, 30%, we'll be flipping a lot of bits. So maybe you'd like to avoid doing that. There'll be many equivalent solutions. So one way to uh, get a much more confident uh, uh, solution is integrating bulk sequencing data. Bulk sequencing data, don't forget, has pretty accurate WAFs, variant allele frequencies, provided that the coverage is pretty high. So it can tell between two mutations which one may come first, which one may come later. It, it, it will tell you if two mutations have an ancestor-descendant relationship, which one should be the ancestor. And the alternative uh, thing is they, they belong to uh, different lineages. That's also fine. But just this one piece of information helps you uh, uh, build the tree much more accurately and figure out where, what, what kind of corrections you should be doing. And um, basically, the bulk data tells you the order of mutations. Single cell data gives you the topology uh, much more accurately. Collectively, they should solve all problems there. And this is the... Uh, uh, general uh, approach that we took. Um, in a recent paper that appeared in Recon this year, and hopefully the journal version will come up pretty soon. Um, so uh, this is a principal approach to integrate the two types of data. Uh, the method is called b uh, developed in collaboration with uh, Nico Barrinkel's group. Um, and the idea is as follows. So, Again, you have the WAFs and the matrices, and you try to uh, have a, this is, this is an MCMC method, I have to warn you. You can come up with a QIP as well, which will be slow. Uh, for, for now, let's, let's stick to the uh, MCMC. Suppose that you have a hypothesis about the topology of the tree, the assignment of the mutations and uh, uh, relative proportions, then you have a cost function. You have to see whether uh, the data really agrees with the suggestion, the hypothesis you have. And you have to do some updates uh, either on the topology or on, uh, uh, in fact, the uh, false positive and false negative rates that will be measured uh, within the assignments. So the overall uh, score has two components. It's a linear combination of the single cell score, which is a function of the tree topology itself, and the uh, false negative and false positive rates that I'm going to call alpha and beta, as well as the uh, uh, score of the bulk data, which is only a function of the topology. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just very briefly describe the MCMC. Uh, Suppose that this is the topology that I uh, propose. I may have also, based on the topology, uh, some false positive and negative rates, um, and maybe a new uh, set of uh, variables are uh, proposed. Um, and based on this, we'll, we'll update the score. If the score is improved, then with certain probability, we accept a uh, uh, new setup and move on. We have to also decide if the topology is right. The uh, second alternative is uh, an update on the topology is proposed. 
Again, we evaluate it based on the score, and we may move on or not. And the topology uh, trivially is uh, uh, updated by cutting an edge and uh, inserting the subtree implied somewhere else. So we, we try uh, several alternatives. Um, in the end, the uh, uh, MCMC hopefully converges, and uh, the ultimate uh, 503 uh, provides you the colonial tree of uh, tumor evolution. Um, so the conditions for accepting a uh, hypothesis is more complex, but I'm, I'm not going to get into the details. Um, uh, it's not very exciting anyway. So uh, the resulting tree, because of the specific nature of single cell sequencing, will be a mutational tree. Here, every mutation belongs to a uh, distinct uh, node, which only harbors that mutation. This can be followed by a second uh, uh, line of analysis that would cluster these mutations together, so paths may be converged, uh, may be uh, collapsed into a single node, depending on, again, the prevalence of the mutations. So, we'll have an infer tree. Um, in the remaining of the talk, um, I'd like to say a few words about how to compare uh, trees, uh, which I, I think is pretty important. Um, the vast majority of the methods that I see uh, use some trivial uh, uh, methods of uh, comparison uh, based on simulations, and maybe maybe we say a few words about these. So. Uh, yeah, the first method of uh, uh, measurement is ancestor-descendant uh, relationship, based on the ancestor-descendant relationship. So we will look at every single pair of mutations. Uh, those pair of mutations that maintain the same ancestor-descendant relationship, for example, um, here, M3 and M6, have the ancestor-descendant relationship that M3 comes first, M6 comes later. We have the same relationship here that adds, up, that adds to uh, the uh, overall score one. And we can look at every single pair of mutations uh, that, that maintain this relationship in comparison to all pairs of mutations. So people have been using this for a while. Um, different lineages accuracy corresponds to those pair of mutations that do not uh, have this relationship. They, in both trees, in the ground root tree and inferred tree, belong to uh, distinct lineages. Again, the fraction of uh, mutations that, that preserve this provides you some measure of accuracy. Uh, Co-clustering accuracy focuses on pairs of mutations that occur at the same node, or same edge, uh, it doesn't matter how, uh, how you interpret it, um, in the ground truth tree. So we may be interested in how M6, M7, and M8 relate to each other in the infer tree. And this is a slightly non-trivial uh, relationship. Um, we may, for example, look at how M6 relates to M M8. Um, for example, M6 is here, M8 is here, we look at the path between M6 and M8 and check out the distinct mutations that are in this path that doesn't belong to this node. So those are uh, contributing to the penalty. The ones that uh, uh, belong to the same node uh, contributes to the similarity score. So um, again, uh, we have to do it for every single pair of uh, mutations and we'll get some notion of uh, accuracy with respect to co-clustering. Um, I'm not going to get into uh, the details, but uh, the bottom line is these three uh, uh, measures of accuracy has been used in the community for a while, and uh, we have been thinking of coming up with an alternative that, first of all, combines them, and uh, more importantly, perhaps, there are cases in which 
each and every uh, one of these three accuracy measures fail. So there are, uh, uh, when the two trees, the inferred tree and the uh, ground tree, are topologically identical in, in under certain measures, these uh, accuracy measures fail. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get into the uh, measures of uh, accuracy in a moment. Uh, let me give some uh, examples from uh, some data sets that we extracted uh, uh, from well-known papers. This, this particular figure may be pretty familiar uh, for those of you who are, who are in the know. This is from Nick Navin's paper from uh, 2014 on a triple negative breast cancer patient. So um, those of you who may remember the paper, uh, the uh, tumor sample that you can see on the left has one dominant clone and three distinct subclones, which are very visible. And the uh, mutations are on the uh, y-axis, x-axis denote the single cells, and the clustering obviously denotes, uh, corresponds to uh, distinct subclones. Um, you can see one here. This, this uh, dominant clone is depicted here, and uh, this thing subclones here, here, and there's one, again, depicted here, are indicated uh, there. Um, so based on uh, some reasonable clustering, it seems like this is the correct topology, or it's an approximation to the correct topology. If you do a single cell analysis, the topology that you'll get is going to be like this. <clears throat> As you can see, um, based on uh, uh, in the end, no matter what you do, there will be some uh, uh, serious error that uh, uh, you, uh, you may make due to the high false negative rate. And, um, the single cell analysis made by SITE, the precursor of B-SITE, results in um, a subclone depicted here, which has been carried over uh, pretty high up in the uh, uh, phylogenetic tree. The uh, integrative analysis corrects this to a large degree. And in fact, if you uh, uh, compare it not with uh, the inferred phylogeny, but rather uh, this clustering, you can see that, in fact, um, within the dominant uh, clone, there is a first spin-off, there's a subclone that, that comes out, uh, characterized by TNC and CBX4. Um, we believe that this topology um, more accurately depicts the uh, evolution of the tumor in comparison to uh, uh, what, more, what uh, you can infer um, from, from simple clustering. And uh, a similar picture uh, emerges in uh, the reanalysis of a data set from Stephen Quake's 2014 PNAS paper. Again, there are uh, distinct uh, subclones that uh, uh, are suggested by an integrative analysis. Um, on the right-hand side, B uh, in the middle depicts the uh, results of the analysis of uh, just single cells. And um, what we have on the left is an analysis of just bulk data, which suggests two distinct topologies. Um, and uh, uh, we, we believe that now, none of the uh, uh, analysis, A or B, uh, provide you a, a good picture, good overall picture. The uh, integrative analysis seems to provide the right order of events. So these are obviously not very interesting uh, figures because we haven't discovered something fundamentally new. Um, much of the problem is there aren't too many interesting data sets available uh, to the public that have both uh, good coverage bulk data as well as uh, single cell data. Um, 
But the data sets are coming up and we are hoping to evaluate uh, more and more. And as they come up, I think we'll have to have um, uh, better measures of uh, comparison. And this is what I, I'd like to talk about in a second. Uh, right. Ooh. Okay, finally. So the second part of the talk is on an uh, upcoming paper uh, in WAMI focusing on comparing clonal trees of evolution. Uh, this is mostly done by a theory student and thus uh, the low tech uh, in the presentation. Nikolai is uh, the theory student who uh, has been working with us recently and uh, Together with my PhD student, Khaled, uh, he developed this algorithm. Um, maybe I should give a formal definition of a clonal tree. We are dealing with rooted, unordered trees, such that each node in the uh, tree contain a set of mutations, set of labels, such that each label occurs only in one of the nodes. Right? So uh, this, this corresponds to the infinite size assumption. And we'd like to compare pairs of trees. Um, mind you, obviously, every mutation occurs once. So that, that gives you a correspondence between nodes in the two trees. If I have one node with just uh, label A, mutation A, in tree 1, and another node that has the same mutation A in tree 2, they must correspond to each other. Alignment is much easier than arbitrary trees with arbitrary labels. Um, so these are some examples of clonal trees. They don't have to be binary. They can, uh, they can have uh, uh, any fan out you may want, but they are rooted. Um, so how do we compare these uh, clonal trees? As we said, there are multiple uh, ways uh, that people have been employing. But we'd like to come up with an integrated method, uh, which is principled and comes up with a single measure. So uh, the measure that I'm going to in introduce will preserve the topological difference um, and will introduce a set of edit operations. And the similarity or distance will be measured with respect to these edit operations. What are these edit operations? Uh, uh, First of all, we should be able to erase or delete uh, labels. The labels that do not fit cannot be maintained to, uh, in, in a uh, uh, topologically altered uh, uh, pair of trees need to be eliminated. I'll come back to that later. We should allow some uh, node deletions, node expansions, and so on, so that the resulting measure, which is going to be a uh, distance, form a pseudometric. So what's a pseudometric? First, it's a slight modification of a metric. Uh, in a metric, the distance between an object and itself will be zero, right? Here, we'll maintain that. But on top of that, the distance between the object and a slightly altered version may still be zero. So uh, between two distinct trees, the distance is not necessarily greater than zero, but it's greater than or equal to zero. Oh, OK. And I'll have to go faster. Uh, it goes pretty fast. Um, the triangular inequality is going to be maintained. So that's not a big deal. Um, and the most important thing is we would like to compute this distance pretty efficiently. It has to be polynomial time computable. So the deleting uh, a label is relatively trivial. Any label can be deleted. And uh, we are not going to allow deletion of arbitrary nodes, but we are going to only allow deletion of uh, leaves, which do not include labels. So if you want to delete a label in its uh, leaf and then delete the leaf itself, two operations are needed. And finally, expansion of a vertex. You can take a, a vertex, split it in two from uh, the top vertex to the bottom pair. There's a split. 
and the uh, labels will be shared, it's possible that one of these vertices will have no labels. It's perfectly fine. So now, coming to the costs, we are only going to charge for deletion of labels. Alterations to the topology will come for free. You'd like to alter the two trees such that they converge to the same tree, both in terms of the topology and the label uh, assignment, and the uh, sort of Steiner tree. This is not a Steiner tree, but rather the uh, median tree that minimizes the overall cost, which is the total number of leaf deletions, I, I'm sorry, label deletions, will uh, uh, define the distance between the two trees. So why do we pay only for labels? Because uh, uh, anti-leaves should not be counted, and we only allow deletion of leaves. Um, so they should not be counted at all. An expansion of a, a node into two nodes, in principle, should not be penalized, right? Because we would like to make sure that trees of different granularities uh, are considered one and the same. So if you have a mutation tree in which every node has a single uh, label, uh, when you compare it against a clonal tree where uh, you have a clustering of labels, there should be basically no cost. Uh, the, the distance should be uh, zero. I, I'm going to wrap it up in a second. So, um, basically it will boil down to the following. Given two trees, we would like to, as I said, come up with a medium tree, T star, such that the distance between T1 to uh, T star plus the distance between T2 to T star is minimized. That's the median tree that I'm talking about. And the uh, total cost will be the distance between the two trees. Obviously, we can make these operations symmetric to make life uh, easier, so that uh, in addition to the node expansion, we can have a node contraction routine. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, label deletions, we can uh, add label additions. But that will complicate uh, the overall description of the distance, so I'm not going to talk about that. The bottom line is, Given the two trees on the left and on the right, uh, the computation of the median tree that you see in the middle is doable in polynomial time pretty efficiently. Um, and we, we have described an algorithm, which is the first algorithm that I'm uh, familiar with on a measure between trees uh, where, the, uh, um, a, uh, where the children of a vertex are unordered. So, um, every single tree edit distance measure that I'm familiar with, where the children of a node are unordered, uh, is NPR to compute. By focusing on leaf deletions only, you make the problem polynomial time solvable, and I think uh, it forms a, a pretty good uh, measure for comparing clonal trees of uh, tumor evolution. Um, I won't be able to get into the details, so if you'd like to hear more about it, uh, uh, you can bug me after the talk. One, one thing I'd like to say, if you don't mind, as a warm-up, if you want to just compare two linear trees, linear topologies, all you have to do is coming up with a matching between uh, subpaths and single nodes, so you have to partition uh, the path into uh, subpaths, contiguous subpaths, and um, uh, match them with single uh, nodes on each side so that you have a uh, one to many and many to one sort of a relationship, and the number of label deletions, overall label deletions, would give you uh, the distance. So that's, that's pretty much it. All right, so we are, we are, um, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. Um, if you have any questions. Okay, sounds good.